Hey, everybody, it's Mike from The Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and brought to you by our official sponsor, The Mike Wagner Show, in Russia, warring author Mia Moses, Zia Missing, available on Amazon. We're here with a terrific lady who is a serial entrepreneur offering a broad range of strategic and tactical um, experience, including extended work in the business development and marketing sector. She also founded uh, quite a few companies, uh, one making an impact on plant-based and a uh, start of um search engine marketing and also an innovative to uh, better alternatives to um, animal-based uh, materials, products, and everything else. She's a multi-award winner and also has a new product which features an alternative to the leathers out there, like leather jackets, leather shoes, and everything called Uncaged Innovations, a brand new biomaterials company. And what makes you unique? We'll find out. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios in beautiful downtown New York City, the amazing serial entrepreneur, award-winning um you know, innovator and also the um, owner of Uncaged Innovations, ladies and gentlemen, the multi-talented Stephanie Down. Stephanie, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Mike. Great to be here. Well, it's great to have you on board, too. So you're basically a serial entrepreneur offering a broad range of strategic and tactical experience, including extended work in business development and marketing. You found your first company back in 1999 called Marcom, one of the first search engine um, marketing agencies. And you also... um later put it to good use and you began doing some uh, CSR consulting, bridging gap between animal welfare and global brands. You also started Good Dot as well too, became the largest plant-based uh, meat company in India. And you also later went on to start Uncage Innovations, which is basically an alternative to uh, leather as well too. Like you wore leather jackets, leather shoes, belt and everything. And of course, you know, just having um, just having a brand new approach to uh, wearing leather without the animals as well, too. So we'll talk about that. And before getting on, Stephanie, tell us how you first got started. Wow. Yeah. So thank you for such a kind introduction. Um, yeah. So my background is, is completely in business. I went to college and as you and I were talking before the show started, I went to Illinois State. So uh, we share the same same uh, Midwest background and um, graduated in, in, in marketing, um, went on to work for some software startups in the, in the 90s, which was a good time to be in the software industry. And then, as you mentioned, I started my first company in 1999, which was an internet marketing company. You know, nowadays, a digital marketing agency is not interesting, but in 1999, you had to explain to people what in the world that was. So it was a, a good time to get in on that. Uh, but a couple of years in, I kind of just was really feeling like I wanted to give back. I wanted to do something to make a bit of a difference. So I started volunteering at an animal shelter. Um, and I was living in Colorado at the time. And um, and then that led to me going vegetarian, which led to me going vegan. And then that's when I started doing work to help animal welfare groups really engage with corporations. Um, and one of my favorite projects that I worked on was getting Tesla to go vegan on their car interiors, um, worked mm. with just different types of companies to go out and educate them on alternatives and, um, and why they should want to remove animals from the supply chain. So it just had me down a path that ultimately resulted in selling my first company and and getting into social enterprises, um, creating vegan products. Mm -hmm. And was it one precise moment that simply influenced you into what you're doing for the rest of your career? Yeah, honestly, I think that probably the one biggest aha moment that I, I remember was when I'd been going for the to the animal shelter every Saturday to volunteer, wa wash, you know, walking dogs, cleaning kennels, just doing things to help around the animal shelter. And every every um, time I'd when I'd finished for the day, I'd go to have a late lunch at uh, a barbecue joint down the street, and I'd get a pork barbecue sandwich. And Yum, one day, make light... me hungry already. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, the light bulb kind of went on that I'd spent all day trying to help one type of animal and then I went and, and was eating a different one and so I started doing a little researching and that really you know headed me down the path of, of kind of look, looking into this and then helping the animal welfare groups was probably the second turning point I just really fell in love with this concept of if we create an alternative you know whether it's food or materials or whatever it might be different alternatives for animal testing you know, if we create something that makes it easier for the companies and consumers to transition and not have to sacrifice that's a great way to remove animals from the supply chain so those two things were big big turning points how did you first get involved with animals and starting with an animal shelter yeah, you know, it was interesting as I, I, I never, I never, I asked my mom once, you know, what did I, uh, when, when did I, you know, develop a, an affinity to animals and she didn't, she didn't have any memories, although she should say that she remember, I said, did I help a little bird or was there something that got me down that path? And she said, no, but I do remember when you came home from Sunday school, when you were about five years old and you were really mad at God for letting all of the animals drown, except two of each kind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's funny how kids, kids see things, right? On, on Noah's Ark. Uh, but yeah, so I just, um, as I, 
as I started in you know about 2001 when I started really looking around. Um, I, I went and volunteered at a homeless shelter. You know, I tried a couple of different things, um, and the animal shelter just stuck. It just really felt like like the right home for me as far as I just um, you know really took a liking to to working with animals. Mm -hmm. And what would you say your favorite animal would be? Well, dogs, certainly, as far as those are the ones that we get to interact the most. But um, outside of that would definitely be primates. Um, I volunteered. I've gone to South Africa and volunteered with at, at vervet monkey sanctuaries. I've, um, you know, so I, I absolutely love monkeys. Mm, that's rather interesting, too. And of course, you know, being part of the chain, any kind of chain whatsoever. And of course, you know, why do animals need to be removed? And why is there an alternative to uh, animals and um, level and all the products? We'll find out just one minute. Stephanie Downs. First, listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the Mike Wagner Show.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention Mike Wagner Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studio. Take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mian Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mian Molson Zia, available on Amazon paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson has got great reviews. And Eve 11 endures by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Wiley, and Manales. So grab your copy today for Goals Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms for in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, I, Apple Music, and also um, on BitChute, Rumble, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Take us with you on any mobile device. Make sure you subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles. Also T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Wagner Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Show.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the founder of uh, Uncaged Innovations, a new biomaterials company, Stephanie Downs, here on the Mike Wagner Show. And before we talk about the, the start of your company, you also won some awards as well, too, if you're innovation. You won the multi-award winner, 40 Under 40, and also the Do, um, do Good Award. And, uh, you know, you also become a TEDx speaker. And uh, tell us about your accomplishments. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so the Do, do Good Award was actually a really um, wonderful award. It was um, from South by Southwest. Um, for for people who were were doing good things to give back, so you know South by Southwest is a very um, infamous conference, so it was a really um, major honor to get that from them, and, and it was also very exciting to be a TEDx speaker. So yeah, so it's been it's been a it's been a great journey. Um, now now I'm over fifty, so I can't win those forty under forty. <laughs> well, that, well you, can, you can start a fifty <laughs> over fifty category. I mean, what's there wrong we with go. That? <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes, you do. And of course, you've been very innovative as well, too. You had started the Marcom company. You also did, um, you know, the Good Dot company as well, too. And you also uh, later uh, started Uncaged Innovations. And uh, how'd you get first started on that? Tell us more about it. Yeah, so, um, you know, Good Dot and you're talking about Uncaged Innovations. So we started the company about two and a half years ago and um, we're working on other alternatives. And I'll, I'll show a little bit on camera here. So this is one of our innovations. And so what's unique about what we're doing and, and how we got started was we wanted to create something that would be a sustainable leather um, that would also provide brands with that same, you know, hand feel of luxurious. So our material is unique. It's actually um a bio-based blend of eight different ingredients, um, things from different things that we grew in the Midwest, things that come from corn that and, and wheat and soybeans, which um, the components that we're using are actually ironically normally fed to cattle. So I, I love that, that we're diverting it from the cow and straight into the leather. Um, also using different ingredients like um, this material here, the, the coloring comes from coffee. Um, so nice. like uh, discarded coffee beans and um, using different natural rubbers and things. So um, the material will biodegrade in less than six months. So that's that's the really the, the big thing we're seeing from fashion and automotive brands, which is where most of the interest is at, is they're wanting you know to create things that will will go back to nature at the end. 
and in particular brand of corn, wheat, soy, or even coffee or anything like that? Is like anything in particular or is it just in general? Just in general, I say we're working with some of the some of the big players of producers in the United States. Um, but really, a lot of what we're trying to work with is what they call agricultural waste streams. So, you know, in the, when you're producing things like those different types of grains and the coffees and stuff, there's lots of things that are, are part of the overall process that don't end up actually getting consumed um, that are not edible. And so, you know, we're trying to use things that are waste streams or byproducts um, that instead of them ending up in the landfill or not having a great use, we can actually divert them into creating materials that can be used in fashion and seats and home goods and things. Mm -hmm. Also, is a non-GMO involved as well, too? We haven't gotten to that level yet as far as because we're still right now as a company, we're at what's called the pilot scale. So we've launched, we've we've graduated from lab scale where you make pieces this big to now we're at the pilot scale. We're making one square foot pieces and then soon we'll be doing um, what's called full scale production where we'll be at large scale production. Um, so we haven't started completely narrowed in on things like non-GMO, but that certainly is the target. Uh, but if we're using things that come from waste streams, they're going to go to waste regardless. Um, so if we can divert them, that's the best. Also, too, the hemp uh, industry has also been involved, too, with the making yeah. as well. Do you see that as more of a competition? Do you plan to incorporate as well, too, or do you plan to uh, complement it? Yeah, I think it would be more of a compliment. Like we could, for example, um, integrate hemp as kind of a backing on the material if we wanted to apply a backing. So I definitely think there'd be some partnerships there. Um, and also, you know, with with hemp, hemp is um, there are people who have made some things that are material alternatives. If they don't out of hemp, but they don't really look like leather, and that's kind of ha half the battle in these situations. Which I learned, you know, coming from the food space, is if we're going to create an alternative that's going to really mentally replace these things with consumers, it needs to look and feel and you know have that same experience otherwise it ends up falling into a kind of novel um novel category that doesn't really you know help remove animals from the supply chain okay and also too with the um animals being used for leather as well too it's like explain the process of having um your leather products you know like non-leather and everything else you know explain the process on that Sure. Yeah. So, you know, there's really two different types of leathers that are out there now. Of course, there's your animal based leather, um, which, you know, a lot of people will we could, the way we look at it is that leather is kind of a co-product in the meat industry, because obviously the cows are, are also being consumed for meat. Um, leather as a hide makes up about five percent of the overall profit of a cow. Um, but the main challenge with leather is and why we consider it a co-product is it really has to go on through extensive processing. You know, you don't just take the hide and put it onto a handbag. Um, it has to go go through an extensive tan tanning process, um, which is really a little bit like embalming skin, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're pretty much have to take the skin and take it through a process. So it's a very highly toxic, um, it, lots of chemicals, lots of water is used. Um, and so it's estimated that about 10,000 liters of water are used to make one square meter of leather. Really? 10,000? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then how, how, <laughs> how many liters of water uh, do you use, uh, you know, make, making your product? Well, in our product, we will use, cause, and that even counting like the water that goes into, you know, creating the grains and the coffee and, you know, everything that goes into our material, we factor all of that in. And even with all of that considered, which is rainwater, um, we will use 93% uh, less water than you would in making an animal product. Hmm. That's really interesting, too. And uh, is rubber also going to be factored as well, too? Like, is that going to be in the future, too? Yeah, we use a little bit of rubber, um, not a high rubber content, but it's um, we use a natural rubber that comes from sustainable forests. Um, so that, uh, yeah, that is one of the ingredients that helps provide some stretch. And that's the thing that's interesting about leather or anytime you're trying to create an alternative, you have to look at all the features, right? So leather is actually a really great material. It's strong, it has a natural stretch, has some flexibility. So you have to, and that's why we bring together various biomaterials is because they each provide a different characteristics that helps us mimic that experience. And also, too, with the new leather that you're also creating, it too, it's just like, how, how do you maintain the leather, like soft, smooth, and everything else, like your typical leather that you go out and um, buy the products, like the, the polish, the creams, and everything else like that. Now, if you say you bought the polishes and creams like you buy <laughs> at stores and put on your products, is that going to harm the, your leather itself? 
You know, we haven't tried that yet. Um, as far as, you know, the material is is waterproof and stuff. So we've been doing different tests. Um, so we haven't tried putting on any, any leathers and, uh, you know, we have materials now that have been sitting, you know, out in the open for about a year and a half. Um, so we've been able to, and they continue to hold up. And, and there's also just a huge battery of amount of tests that we go through. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're working with various large fashion brands and automotive companies, and we have access to their labs where they do like abrasion testing, where they try to see how it will hold up, you know, like 10,000 and rubs and a hundred thousand flex tests and and so on so i at this point we don't think we're going to need the the care that leather has but um, we're kind of you know time will tell mm -hmm. and of course time will tell too of course you know uh animals uh you know removing some some supply chain it's like you know the necessary uh, behind that trying to maintain sustainability yeah. and uh just about everything like that yeah, exactly. And that's what right now for fashion brands or automotive, anybody really that's looking to replace animal leather, unfortunately for them, the only option that's really available are synthetic leathers, um, which a lot of people might, the immediate word people might think is like pleathers, you know, from the 80s. And they, they've co come quite a, a far away on as far as quality. But unfortunately, they are all made out of plastic, and which is, you know, a new problem, a new global problem that we're facing and that people are trying to get away from plastic. So um, that's why there's such a high demand for the type Types of things that we're doing is we're, we're solving the challenge of, of removing animals and the environmental impact there, but then also the end of life issues with synthetic leathers. Mm -hmm. and, and and also too, uh, what are some of the um, the hot products that you have out right now? It's just like, what do you consider your best sellers and what do you consider, you know, putting on the market? Sure. Yeah. So for us right now, we don't have, we don't, there's no products in the market yet that a consumer can buy. Um, we we're working with fashion brands. So we're going to, we're a business to business model. So our customers are fashion brands. Um, like I can show you one here. This is a card holder that I carry. That's a, a prototype that a company has done. So for us, we'll just sell this material and then brands will put it into their designs. And so we're working with various fashion brands that they're prototyping it in shoes and wallets and watch bands and jewelry. Um, and then they'll be coming to market. Uh, I would think the, the first earliest will probably be this fall um, that the first pieces will start to come to market, um, and then and then in, and then growing from there. So because we have to fit into their time frames, fashion brands and fashion brands plan about eighteen to twenty four months out. Um, wow. Automotive plans at least five years out. So mm. um, you know we're working with both, but it, it takes some time for you to start seeing things on a shelf. Mm -hmm. and, and then once again, uh, just to emphasize, how, how do you see yourself as a game changer in the overall industry? Yeah, I think I, you know, I've been involved in the vegan products industry for a while and I've been watching this space. I think where I really see us as a game changer is providing, it's just the perfect time right now with sustainability being such, you know, hot, an interest, not just a hot topic, because I think it's here to stay. Um, you know, it's just something that companies are significantly concerned about. Um, and fashion, the fashion industry is, is considered the second most environmentally damaging industry. Um, it's estimated that a dump truck full of clothing goes into a landfill every single second. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's where we're going to really be a game changer is we're going to be able to provide them something that if something ends up in a landfill, you know, when those things happen, that it's going to biodegrade. Um, so, you know, that and that's our challenge as a company is you have to create something that's kind of indestructible while the consumer is carrying it. Um, but then also it knows to biodegrade when it gets into the right conditions. Now, now would it be like resellable, resellable too? like, say, if uh, like, say I bought, you know, like, say my wife bought, buys your buys a dress you got on the market or let's say i buy your shoes we outgrow them we don't need them now can they be like resellable or can it be like you know do they provide a, a higher market value than uh, most I don't know. I mean, definitely, um, you know, some of the competitors that like, for example, there's mushrooms leather is a popular thing that, that people are have been starting to bring some products to market with that's definitely selling at a, at a higher um, amount. So I think they could definitely be resellable. But what's also interesting is it's actually recyclable also. So, you know, for whether it's on the cutting, you know, in the in the factories where they're producing the goods, if they're scraps that come from cutting out the pieces, or if um, some brand more and more brands now are starting to do reclaim programs, where at the end of your shoe life they want you to bring them back to them um, if they can actually break down the the garment or the um, you know accessory um, we can actually take the material and recite like grind it down and to put it into a second version of bio leather mm, that's really interesting reformable shoes i can see that <laughs> happening <laughs> in the meantime where can we find more information about your uh products at yeah, so the best place would be to go to uncagedinnovations.com. And then we're also on Instagram under Uncaged Innovations. So that would be the, the those are two best places to find us. 
We'll certainly check that out. What's coming up for uh, Stephanie Downs and her amazing company, Uncaged Innovations, in 2023? We'll find out in just one minute. You listen to The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonicweb Studios, and brought to you by official sponsor, The Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Mia Mosazia Missing. We'll be back with the, uh, the founder of Uncaged Innovation, Stephanie Downs, after this time. We're back with... Uh, the founder of Uncaged Innovation, Stephanie Downs, here on the Mike Wagner Show. You you give us a really good uh, rundown of all the products and why your leather is amazing. I'm ready to buy some for the um, upcoming year and such. And what else can we expect from you in 2023 and beyond? Yeah, for us, the main focus this year is just going to be bringing some products to market with our, our initial brand partners and also scaling the innovation. So that's the big, you know, big challenge in this industry. You'd asked earlier, how are we going to have an impact? You know, there's various technologies that people have developed in biomaterials um, that really aren't making it beyond the lab, aren't making it beyond very small scale. And so that's that's the big, big thing is for us, we're already working with a manufacturing partner to produce large quantities of the material and kind of really scaling it. So, and then of course we'll be doing another investor raise this year. That's always a big part of startup life. Um, so that investor raise and scaling and, and some initial products coming to market, that's what's on the horizon for us this year. And we'll certainly check those out, especially for the upcoming holiday season and everything else. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Oh goodness, um, that's an interesting that's an interesting question. Um, hmm. You know, there I, there was a mentor I had earlier early on in my career, actually probably my first boss out of college. That um, uh, he was a little bit he was a little bit intense. <laughs> a lot of people did. <laughs> A lot of people didn't necessarily enjoy working for him, um, but but you know he was he was somebody who uh, was willing to take young kids and and work them really hard. And if you survived and, and you know and thrived in that environment, he kept piling on more and more responsibility. Um, so I was you know just one you know fresh out of college and you know a year or so into my career, I was over in Europe like presenting to CEOs of major corporations. Um, one, one time I even had somebody stop me in the middle of a presentation, ask me how old I was. No. Um, you know he. Just, <laughs> Um, so it just, you know, kind of, I definitely felt like I worked for him for two and a half years and then our software company was acquired by IBM and it was definitely an intense two and a half years, but I felt like I learned, you know, 10 years of experience in those two and a half years. I'm always thankful in hindsight that I, I had that boot camp. It certainly does too. And a lesson to be learned by all. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Oh, I think the the best advice is is to remember that you vote with your dollars every day. You know whether it's um, what what you purchase with food or your materials or whatever. You know, be a conscious consumer and remember that you know it's not just every every two to four years that we get to vote and and have an impact on the world. Um, you really you make make decisions every day with your dollars and and vote for what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And certainly most important as well. Once again, we're with. Uh founder of uh, Uncaged Innovation, Stephanie Downs here on the Mike Wagner Show. Stephanie, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love having you back. And once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your works? Yeah, best place to um, go to is uncagedinnovations.com or you can check us out on Instagram on Uncaged Innovations. Those are the best pl places to connect. So thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure to be here. We'll, we'll certainly check that out. And also, again, a very big thank you for your time, Stephanie. You've been absolutely amazing. Looking forward to having you again soon. <laughs> Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back and wish you all best. And Stephanie, you definitely have a great future ahead of you. Thank you.